Welcome to Esoterica, the podcast. I'm Chris Schultz, and um, with me today is our special guest, Blixa Bargell. Um, how are you today, Blixa? I'm fine, thank you. So the first question we usually ask guests on our show is um, the, the, the same thing everybody's going through around the world. How has the uh, pandemic been affecting you, and um, how are you? How are you? I, uh, I, I, uh... The uh, the pandemic coincided with the actual release of our latest album, and uh, it destroyed all the activities that were connected to that, including all the tours, all the uh, European tours, the American tour. Everything was and is cancelled. So since basically. Uh, since one year ago, I am more or less in quarantine. I ran away from the virus. I'm currently living in Portugal. I'm in the south of Portugal, where the uh, incidence is uh, around 10 per 100,000 people right now. So I'm relatively safe, but I still don't go out. I don't see anyone. I don't take any risks. So everything is on hold. Yeah. Has the um, has the vaccine started making its way around Europe yet? Yeah, yeah, it is in various degrees. Uh, Britain doing very well, and uh, Germany is uh, suffocating itself in bureaucracy and uh, mismanagement. But uh, yeah, it's it's here. It's it's going around. I will be vaccinated at some point. Yeah. Best to say so. And, you know, I, I'm in America. I think the whole world has seen, um, we have not handled ourselves very well the last um, no. year or two. No, it's not anybody informed is, knows all this, so it's not really worse. There are no new informations that we can share. Yeah, true that. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about today is... Um, we new wanted to talk about collapse. Collapse. So, um, mm -hmm. 40th anniversary. Um, so part of this uh, was such a, a, which a new sound, what was, um, I guess, kind of the thought process in, in creating this album? Was it? Well, yeah, it is, it is the first concert that uh, Einstürz and Neubauten at that point as a trio played outside Berlin was in Hamburg. And uh, in Hamburg, the organizer of the concert was also a uh, notorious uh, record releaser, a, a record label called, uh, actually, what was it called? I think it was called Zigzag. Mm -hmm. And the name of the character was Alfred Hilsberg. He was quite famous in Hamburg then for, uh, he released lots of records and he had quite an impact on the, uh, uh, the German scene at the time. He organized that festival where we played and uh, later asked us if he would record for his label. And the first thing we did for that was um, recording in Hamburg, in a recording studio uh, near the uh, Hamburg Harbor, re uh, recording a double single. Uh, new for us was also a, uh, a musician playing with us called uh, Mufti FM Einheit, who we met in Hamburg at that particular concert. And uh, after we released that double single, which was the first where we basically had two percussionists, mm -hmm. and the first one that had a recorded version of uh, uh, the metal drum set that uh, Andrew has just created. So he created basically uh, what is considered in, in its look, a drum set, but it was made entirely out of found materials and stolen stuff from building sites. But it looked like a drum set. Mm. And uh, after that double singer was released, uh, Alfred asked us if we would uh, consider recording an album for him. Of course, we jumped at the possibility and the conditions were, I know I made a contact with him written on a, on a, on a uh, you know little piece of paper in a in a bar, 
that he's allowed to sell 1,000 copies of the record. And after that, we have the rights back. And he gave us a budget of 5,000 German marks, 10 days in the studio. So every day in the studio was 500 marks. Mm -hmm. uh, he did not include a sound engineer. So we came to the studio and they, they told us, uh, well, this is, this is where you plug in the instrument. These are the uh, equalizers. Here's the faders. And, uh, this is where you hit record uh, because the budget did not include him as an engineer. He just left and he left us his phone number. So we were thrown into basically into cold water and saying like, how do you record? So we had to learn how to record. And we made many mistakes which you can hear on the album, like the cutting off the, uh, the end reverb of, uh, of things. So things abruptly end suddenly and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, because we, well, we also had to learn how to splice a tape and to edit tapes together. So every single we did all this ourselves. Oh wow! And uh, the uh, musical there is an evolution. I can certainly see the evolution from the double single before to this record and the records that follow it, which was that the uh, the drum set itself dissolved as a set it no longer looked like a drum set. And mm -hmm. there were no more, uh, there is a little, a little booklet with the original release of the album. And in the booklet, I also state that, uh, yeah, we, that we abandoned the normal drum set and uh, that we try to like create, that we try to concentrate uh, entirely on, on found objects and on, uh, on metal main, yep. main, basically. So uh, of course, Neubau at that point was a very, very much a percussion-based outfit. We had two percussionists, two drummers, Mufti and Andrew, who both played basically were percussionists. Andrew originally came from being a conga player, so okay. a, giant, a giant Beatles and Santana fan. Really? From, yeah, that's, that's his background. So he was definitely a percussionist and... Uh, and Mufti, Mufti also, I remember I saw, before I met Mufti in Hamburg, I did actually see him in a free hippie festival playing congas. So they were both conga players. <laughs> Definitely not drummers who were really like playing with your hands and using objects and all that. So that was, uh, and I am, uh, I was more or less responsible for everything else. I was, uh, I held a guitar since my, um, my father gave me one for my 16th birthday. So I had an electric guitar. And uh, those are the, the, main, the main sides of the, of the whole creation. Like we tried to, we definitely didn't, I, I listened to the album recently, which I don't do very often. I don't very often listen to my own albums. Mm -hmm. But I listened to it uh, in order to prepare for this for this particular interview, and uh, I realized, yeah, there's definitely there was definitely no will to please anyone. Right. There was definitely no. We, 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 I don't know if there was a will to displease anyone, but there was definitely no will to please anyone. There was no compromise. There was no. There, there was no, uh, there was not even any expertise, knowledge or anything. As I said, like we had to learn how to record ourselves. We made many mistakes, like being one channel being 30% louder than the other one or cutting off reverbs when we splice the tapes together, any, all kinds of things. But uh, we also learned a lot of uh, things in, in the process in these 10 days. 10 days meaning 10 days for like recording all this mixing it, editing it together, uh, things about masking, uh, I didn't even know anything about that back then. We gave Alfred his back a tape, a reel-to-reel -reel tape, and that reel-to-reel -reel tape is what became the album. If it was mastered by anyone or not, I had no clue. I made the album cover too. I went to a uh, newspaper called Tuts, which was the only left-wing uh, daily newspaper that started uh, itself in that time. and. Uh, I went into their like graphics room and uh, designed the uh, the cover and uh, used their apparatus to make the uh, recording sleeve and wrote the, the wrote the font, did the booklet, 
So it was very much a, a do-it-yourself experience. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, I did not write lyrics, and uh, a lot, a large part of uh, everything we were doing was improvisation. We improvised a lot with rhythm. We improvised and recorded and uh, worked with with the things that we have recorded. And of course, there was no automation in in the mixing process. So. Sometimes we had four people standing behind the desk and each one had to learn when to put what fader up or uh, which when to open what channel and uh, and so on. But uh, I didn't write lyrics, so uh, I improvised in the same way as everybody else was improvising in music. I, I improvised the words, uh, sometimes to more and sometimes to less success. There are about like three or four tracks that didn't make it on the album. Even the album is short. But uh, yeah, I also have good ideas and not so good ideas. So that's it. That's, yeah, it, uh, it, it's funny that you mentioned that about the lyrics because um, you know I, I don't speak German, um, and I actually when I was listening to the album last night, I was trying to find translations. And I, I think for me personally, listening to the songs, not understanding what you were saying, actually makes the music much more visceral. Yeah, well, react emotionally to the sound of your voice. I think I think I had a certain attitude in in, in singing and a certain uh, that that infected my my voice too, and I that that was more relevant than uh, than actually the words that that I was uttering. Uh, mm -hmm. I I had the same attitude on stage. I did the same thing on stage. I had no set. I had no we had no set, we had no fixed songs, we had no lyrics, so I was improvising the same way there. But that process had its limitations simply. So when I said before, I can see the ev evolution between like uh, the double singer we did before when there was still a drum set and uh, the album where things started to dissolve and become uh, a bit broader in uh, their musical um, um, in, in their musical will to experiment, I can see where that was leading, and it also meant in my in my uh, in my um, lyrical output that I had to start fixing ideas, that I had to start writing down ideas when they came, and that I had to start elaborating on on ideas to, to get anywhere, to get away from the more formularic approach that a pure improvisation uh, in, automatically uh, creates. So. Hmm. Now, one of the things that I, uh, I read about, you know, it, it, it's funny when you look at um, critics writing about your work and a lot of times people interpret their own things but one of the things that I found really interesting was um, the whole um, theater of cruelty um, thought process yeah. did a lot of that come into play with this or did that develop out yeah, of yeah that was that was a, a quite a, a nice coincidence the first review of the album in a German music uh, magazine music magazine was called sounds and was actually a magazine that I read from back back in the 70s. Um, the first review in there was quoting Anthony Artaud in connection with our album. It started with a quote by Anthony Artaud, then uh, writing about the, the album. And uh, I said, hmm, that's interesting. And I started reading Artaud because <laughs> of that. I didn't know him. Mm -hmm. uh, funny enough, my girlfriend knew him. My girlfriend had a book, so she just gave me the book, and uh, uh, that's fine. But uh, that's how how I how I uh, stepped into that. It was it's not the other way around. Interesting. Um, funny enough, also is that the guy that wrote the review is the father of. He later did an interview with, with me, and uh, he's the father of somebody that made all our record sleeves in the in the nineties. Hmm. So, so little uh, more, more on the side. Now he, the the fact that uh, he, this was quoted there uh, actually led me to that. Yeah, the theater of cruelty. It has been a self 
a perpetual mobile in, uh, in, in journalism. You know? Journalism always creates its own uh, feeding mechanism. You look up a band, you look up the uh, what have other people written about it, and then things get perpetually repeated over and over and over again. So that connection, I didn't come up for me. The journalist made up that connection, and yeah. it has been self-feeding itself ever since. That's interesting, because I, I myself, when I, w I started reading about it, went down a rabbit hole last night, and um, it was exposed to all kinds of new stuff that I'm very excited about. So that was kind of cool. And, uh, you know, I'm a longtime fan of the residents um, and they actually early I on in their career. The eyeball behind you, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, get one there. Um, early on in their career, they had the theory of phonetic organization, which is sort of along the same lines. It's the, the sound of words more than the meaning of words. That... Well, it's not, absolutely not in my line. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so most of the songs in the album, um, I noticed it seems like Collapse is the, the only song that's like a, a more traditional, like proper song, I guess. And it, it's, it's guitar heavy. It's, it's got probably the most lyrics. Uh, oh, yeah, it's longer than everything else. Yeah. That's the only thing I can see. <laughs> I don't see more or less. I, I, there was one particular instrument that has also been made up in the time that also have been has been invented in the time, which is a uh, a long metal spring, uh, probably probably about four centimeters in in diameter, and about uh, in in its unstretched version, probably a one meter long. And that has been put into a metal frame and uh, fixed with a, a pickup. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has been with us ever since. So since 1980, 81, we had this amplified metal spring. Usually it's under the name bass spring. Uh, that appears in that particular song, Collapse, I believe, and for the first time. And, uh, you know, it hasn't got any, it's as good as a bass drum. It hasn't got much of a range in different sounds or mm -hmm. in different notes even. And uh, Andrew's idea was to play the most totalitarian kind of rhythm possible. <laughs> boom, 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 and boom, 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 boom. That was his idea. Very effective. Yeah. And uh, yeah, based on that on that rhythm, uh, everything builds builds on that. So there's one chord on the guitar. I used to, I only played detuned guitars at, at that time. I tuned them to whatever I felt in that very moment. So I played my detuned uh, guitar chord. It runs through the whole thing, and everything else is like uh, comic strip sound words on top of it. <laughs> extra pieces. Mm -hmm. a, a common thing all throughout the album, I noticed, that, that, that kind of idea of a rhythm going through with additional noises being put on top of it seems to be a one of the ideas that we, we kept repeating all over the album. Yeah, it, there seems to be like a thing of, like, of tearing down. That's um, like the title Collapse. I, I was thinking initially that that was just something falling down, but there seemed, the emotion that I get from the album is tearing down. Well, I, I had a bit of a, uh, my, my general attitude was pretty apocalyptic at the time. So the, so, uh, the collapse, I was of course referring to a g the general collapse of the world rather than uh, a, a small little collapse. I was mm -hmm. referring to the giant big collapse, which the, <laughs> That particular track was used by the Green Party for a, one of their election spots in the uh, in the early eighties. Oh wow! <laughs> Bis zum Kollaps nicht viel Zeit. Not much time until to the Kollaps. Yeah, it was uh, so. It come to some good use somehow. There you go, right? That's a powerful <laughs> message. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. It's not much time to the Kollaps. Uh, uh, and other more cryptical things like we are the new golden horde 
and uh, nightly migrationism is not going to stop us and whatever. And, uh, as I said, I, I improvised and uh, all these things came out. Hmm. Did you have um, any concept at that time that, that 40 years later um, you'd still be going strong? No. I, the, the, I was at that time, everything was very, very short lived. Every, every project that I was touching was, was not meant for eternity. The very moment that I signed a recording contract by a lawyer named Kennedy in London, with a stupid record company called Sun Bizarre, I realized that uh, Neubauten is here to stay. That's the moment I realized that. Mm -hmm. I, I, before that, I always thought these things are, next week I'm gonna do something else and it's gonna be called something else. Wow. And I, I had never realized um, in, until, so I would say about two weeks ago, um, I heard collapse for the first time and I've just, I've been listening to uh, your catalog like exclusively the last couple of weeks. And mm -hmm. the, uh, the amount of, of impact on the bad seeds that, that comes from your sound is unbelievable. Like I, it, oh, yeah, in, the, in the early times, definitely. Yeah. It was there. This, uh, in the early times, uh, the bad seeds were more, more experimental than what they became later. Definitely. It's, yeah, sure. I mean, from her to eternity and all the early early things there, yeah, there, there are, yeah, I'm all over it. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, in collapse, I I heard, um, I could hear Saint Huck come out of that. That they sort of driving. True, it's the same thing of like a detuned guitar with a constant constant uh, chord. Also in Saint Huck, Saint Huck is the first song that the Bad Seeds recorded. Oh, really. I went with Nick, Nick to the studio in the morning, which was John Fox. There was a double X studio from the, the, the guy from Ultra Fox, the original singer. It was his studio and we went there in the morning and there was a grand piano and Nick had this idea, which was based just on a one chord. And I tuned my guitar accordingly to so something that seemed fitting to that chord and uh, uh, yeah, I played that, that uh, general chord. At that time, I still had, had a, uh, a, somebody had did build me an effect uh, pedal that wasn't doing nothing else but interrupting the signal. So you could do the length of the interruption and uh, you could, yeah only two knobs. So uh, I, I did use that pedal to have uh, my guitar standing in front of the amp. Every time the pedal would let the signal through, a feedback would start and then it, it would interrupt it so the feedback would stop. Mm -hmm. And when it turns itself on, the feedback would come back. This is a constant drone that you hear going throughout St. Huck. There's this this is the feedback of my guitar, which sounds a bit like a flute, actually. And uh, Nick's chord, and then my chord on the guitar, and then I played an additional uh, freestyle, uh, freestyle hacking uh, piece of uh, try and error, where I just, it's one of the, also one of the Neubauten techniques. I record it all over the place, look for the best moments, and erase everything else. Mm -hmm. And, I suggested to Barry to play a, uh, a note and an octave on the bass. Okay. Nothing else. <laughs> he did. And I suggested whistling the chorus. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah. That is as much, that is the space I had in the beginning of the bad seats. Mm -hmm. And at the time before I left the band, uh, I. You know, I went to went to the studio. I was given a, a, a chart of the chords, and then we played the song, and then we recorded about eight songs a day. Not so interesting. Yeah, I I hold them dearly. It's all fine with me, but uh, I I couldn't really continue doing two bands in my life. It would seem like a, a lot of work, and just touring alone, let alone studio time. I would think would be asking a lot of yourself. 
Um, so you mentioned um, the the latest album came out. Everything got kind of put on hold with that. Um, I know. Are, are there any plans at this point to um, continue that tour, or you're still very? Yeah, it's, it's, it's all the tour, all the touring, all the concerts are delayed to 2022. Mm -hmm. Nothing is going to happen this year. It is uh, even testing strategies and people showing their. If, vaccination certificates that just doesn't work it's uh, yeah. it's ridiculous so we have to wait till this is over and uh, we somehow uh, be able to play again i have done i've recorded several things while here with remote technology with my engineer in berlin i recorded songs for other people i wrote lyrics for other people I wrote lyrics for other people to sing, and I uh, sang on other people's songs that they sent me, uh, of which I cannot tell you anything about. You will find out later. But uh, yeah, that's that's all I really do. I have my microphone with me, and uh, uh, I work with some remote technology with my engineer in Berlin on, in a Zoom conference to communicate with him and with some miraculous modern technology to be able to uh, to do remote recordings it is it. you know it, it's hard to it's hard to find the positive um, from this pandemic but I, I think the the use of zoom and some of the collaborative technology that we've come up with um, is, is definitely a good thing oh yeah sure and especially in in like backwater Germany, if it comes to digital technology, so now they suddenly realize that uh, that there is some real push necessary. Okay, well, anything else you want to know about collabs? Um, so, it, so it's funny you had mentioned that you haven't listened to that in a long time. How how did it feel for you to to go back and revisit? Well, I I heard the really definitely abrasive quality of the whole thing. I heard my youth, I heard how much my voice was, my voice now is much, much lower than what it was in when I was 22. Yeah. It's, it has changed quite a lot. You can hear how much I'm actually about to lose my voice and collapse. It's already kind of scratchy and going away. And, uh, but you also hear in a, in a lot of embryonic state, you hear all the things that will become Neubauten later. You already hear the piano based song. Mm. You know, not everything is abrasive and, and harsh, and uh, you already hear all these all these things. So the, the uh, Sehnsucht, which would probably translate to addicted to desire, is uh, is there 1981. Not Rammstein's Sehnsucht. 1992 or something, because they used the same idea and the same word like uh, 12 years later. Mm -hmm. um, it's already there. All these, all the, also the uh, what did lead from uh, the uh, giving up the idea of the drum set as a fixed structure and going into the pure idea of objects and materials. And that uh, exploded with the album that we would do after that. After that, we did an album that was, uh, its working title was Hunters and Collectors, hunting sounds, collecting objects, etc., and would become the drawings of the patient or team where we literally tried everything. We tried every material under the sun, we tried everything that was unthinkable of. We had all kinds of strategies in recording, like throwing uh, microphones over the Berlin Wall, things like that, things, things that uh, were outside of any normal constellation of, uh, of what, how to make an album or make a record. And in the same time, not being an art project. I still considered this very much being a band. And if I have to ask, and I did always in, in interviews, always in, if I had to define my, my uh, relationship to say rock music, I would usually say, oh, well, you know, rock music is something great in, 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 in even years and 
something bad and obvious, but uh, it is definitely my um, my musical upbringing and my musical background. I, simply, I am born in 1959. I grew up with rock music and especially with the German rock music of the time. I grew up with Can and Neu and Kraftwerk mm -hmm. and the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and the Doors. This is my background. Yeah. My background is not punk. Yeah. Yeah. Punk is an, a, 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 was a really important blow that blew open a lot of doors, what became possible, especially yeah. that it became possible to do something yourself, to be able to make a record yourself. When I was 15 or 13, when I did my first steps in music, I could only dream of ever making a record was so, something so far away into the arms of like utopia then uh, and punk blew that possibility open I'd say oh, well, you have a you, you have an idea you can make it you can make a single which also in a completely obsolete format at the time yeah. you can release it on a cassette or whatever it's all the things that we did so but musically my background is earlier than that definitely mm -hmm. So even in the times when in our most, um, let's say in a true sense of the word experimental period at like drawings, drawings of the patient of tea, I still considered it a, a band or maybe even closer a rock band. Yeah, not a not an art project, more a band. No, exactly. This is also, I, I think the first time we played in London, uh, it was a, a big, it, 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 there was a big review in the New Musical Express for that show. And the guy was completely blown off his feet by what we were doing. And that's explicitly what, what he wrote. He wrote, they do all this, but it is not an art project. They do it like they are a band. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the, the whole essence of it. We had this Basically, you could see there are people on stage and somehow some things remind you of a, a rock band because there's somebody who has a bass guitar hanging around his neck, but everybody else is crawling around on the ground and plays unusual materials. And uh, there's somebody standing in front at a microphone and he screams and uh, whatever, and sometimes he falls down too. And all that looks like a completely over-the-top uh, rock band. Yeah. It yeah. just didn't sound like it. <laughs> and that's when I heard, you know, I heard live recordings of the MC5, and sometimes I said, "Oh, yeah, well, that, that actually sounds like Neubauten." <laughs> when they were not in the formal egg, when they were improv, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, and I can see that looking at the at the at the progress that you guys have made over the over the years. It's definitely um, there's no pretension there, which. No. Or band. And that's one of the things I had read in the re one of the early reviews is I think whoever was reviewing Collapse was looking at it as an art installation as opposed to a band. And I'm like, I didn't get that feel. Um, yeah. Sounds like no, yeah, you see, I mean, if you look at the record sleeve, you also see the reference, you know, referencing Pink Floyd <laughs> rather than... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny, so I, I, I was... Um, I put collapse on for my wife because um, I'm like, I was trying to get some stuff out of it. I'm like, listen to this and tell me if it reminds you of St. Huck. And the first thing she said was, it sounds like Pink Floyd. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. There's those little... Uh, I, I, I came from Pink Floyd was probably, the first album I had was Pink Floyd. Mm. And I came from Pink Floyd and I went very fast from Pink Floyd to Cannes. That's, uh, that's my musical socialization, or one aspect of it. I also went to the Velvet Underground, but everybody did. Yeah. So, no, not everybody. Some people didn't, and they usually the ones that are not that good. <laughs> well, it's an interesting time that you were growing up in. Like, there's a... Um, I yeah, think it's, a, it's a great, uh, the great uh, watershed, yeah. And we live in an interesting time now. I think one of the things that... Um, 
that, that younger people today are missing out on is that whole album experience. Everything is Spotify, it's streaming. <laughs> yeah, a, yeah. Just, I still got all that and I haven't sold them. <laughs> I mean, like, and that was a cheat for me. And when I first got into music, like if I got into your band, I would have to go hit record stores to find the albums and I was yeah, able yeah. to stream everything, you know? It's a yeah. cheat. Yeah, now, now basically everything is available. I, it's not true. It's, uh, I, I, uh, most of my information about music nowadays, I get from radio programs, you know, online, of course. You know, and I listen to the BBC Three Late Junction. And uh, every now and then I hear something exciting that I didn't know before. Or yesterday, WFMU, everybody knows WFMU, but yesterday, Sunday morning in, in New York, uh, I, I heard a very long show, which was full of exciting music that I haven't heard before. Great, fantastic. So I make my notes and then I can try to find and uh, search for it. But I tell you a lot of the great things that I didn't know, they're not that easy to find. I don't just hit Spotify and there they are. That would yeah. be a, that would be utopian in a way, but it isn't. You would. Uh, we had a in the in the late seventies and early eighties. There was a record shop in Berlin. He, the guy that was running it, Burkhard Seiler, uh, first started going flying every two weeks to London to buy singles. He was flying there like in the 77, 78, etc. He started flying to London by singles. Reggae singles and punk singles. And he was, by, by his background, he was an old avant-garde guy. So he bought the weirdest stuff that you can get. Mm -hmm. And then later he opened a record shop. And he, he very fittingly named the record shop The Sensor. The Sensor, the, you know, the one that censored things. Because he chooses what he sells. And he gives you the records that he thinks are worth listening to. You couldn't just go in there and say, I, I want this and that. He had a very selected stuff because he's censoring everything. And that would be actually very helpful if you wouldn't, instead of having Spotify, if you would have a censored thing where somebody just, I guess that is existing in many, many ways and I'm doing probably doing the same, where you just play or have all these things and stream all these things that are great and mm -hmm. hard to find and uh, can enlighten your life somehow. But uh, there are things that are existing. Of course, you look at the light in the attic or, or uh, people that uh, you know, do selected research on 78 rotation per minute records, etc. There are good attempts to do that. So not everything is bad about streaming, but I agree with you. Uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't miss the, my my uh, musical socialization, including all the vinyl and all the albums, yeah. Yeah. Uh, have an almost fetish-like character, yeah. There's, a, there's an adventure in finding that stuff. And yeah. that's what we try and, to do with our podcasts. Yeah, fine. <laughs> yeah, cool. No, we we can find things that they don't know. Yeah, introduce, and, and that's hopefully like this episode, I'm, I'm hoping to introduce a younger audience to, to new this is something that you need to check out. You're not going to find it, um, you know, on the mainstream. You maybe I found it interesting that uh, what I read in, in uh, several interviews, Algiers, the band, you know? Mm -hmm. I've heard Algiers. Yeah, I have, I've never listened to them, but I've heard. <laughs> the first thing that I notice is because I've got Google Alert. Google Alert means when my name gets mentioned somewhere, then I get an email. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, they kept mentioning in interviews that uh, their one of their most liked guitars is me. Hmm. They liked my guitar playing, and they liked especially that you know this like uh, very very aggressive playing as I had in the early Bad Seats and uh, and uh, in Neubauten. I thought, well, that's interesting. I influenced some people which I would not expect. They are a strange political gospel, post-punk, uh, post-rock outfit. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it's not, it's not, it's very interesting, Algiers. Hmm. 
I'll have to check that out. Yeah, and I ran across, um, I, and I haven't listened to them. There's an Australian band um, called Collapse. And, oh, yeah. Because, uh, you know, I, I Googled it, and it popped up. Yeah, you see, so, I mean, this, this thing, Google Alerts, is uh, it's interesting. I, I, I always just get the message. Usually I get the messages because somebody mentioned me or the band in interviews. Saying, well, you know, something like Neubaum, like Neubaum, like Blixer, like so and so. That's interesting because it's it's a reference. You can say like the Velvet Underground, but yeah. you can't really say that about many other people or artists. But uh, the other thing that I usually get get uh, emails from Google Alert for is dance theatre. Everywhere around the world, wherever they do dance performances, like you know, Vancouver or Vancouver, London, San Francisco, what do you name it? And then suddenly Neubarten appears in it. <laughs> and uh, I was living in San Francisco for a long time, and uh, I get this message that uh, somebody is dancing to one of my pieces. Hmm. So I, I called the uh, institution, which was the, I don't know, San Francisco uh, Modern Art uh, Museum or something like that. Hey, somebody is dancing to my music. Have you got any permission for that? And uh, the, he, that, guy, that guy was doing a piece, uh, three pieces, one on a piece of mine, one on Laurie Anderson, and one on Louis metal machine music. Hmm. And the answer was, oh, I didn't know where to find you. Oh, you're not that hard to find. No, exactly. <laughs> right. I was, uh, yeah, even getting contact for you for this interview was, uh, was, was not hard. No. You, you got some, you got a good PR staff, which is. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, On the business side, we were never very uh, good. We signed a record contract to a really bad record label, the same one that fucked uh, Fucked uh, Genesis and Psyche TV and Coil and uh, all the others. Uh, no, we were not good. We still haven't got the rights back for our first couple of albums. Collapse is the only one. Everything after that is still at first uh, owned by some bizarre. And whatever we do, if you want to put on a video of a live show in 1984, some bizarre takes it down three days later. Oh, really? I. Hey. Yep, that's what it is. Still haven't paid a single cent in royalties. Wow. Too, too, too much of that out there. Yep. Um, so one thing I wanted to touch on uh, before I let you go. So I, I noticed on, on your website, you have a, um, um, a new project. You're doing sort of a collaboration um, through no. um, supporters. No. No. I mean, that's what we were doing with, with uh, Neubauten for a long time now. Okay. Since 2002. My wife invented crowdfunding. She oh. invented it for Einstürzen and Neubauten. We have been producing uh, several albums and a, a lot of other little uh, albums, let's say, uh, in, in a crowdfunding in a crowdfunding platform that she has built for us before the name crowdfunding existed. Mm -hmm. And the last one that we did, we, did, we didn't really need it to build a platform again. We just used one of the existing ones. In that case, it was Patreon. And uh, we produced the last mm, conglomerate of works that uh, resulted in an album there. With my website right now, I uh, they, I just have like a 10, a 10 euro fee to be, be part of it and have uh, everything there. I'm trying to work on my autobiography, but it's not a collaboration. Mm -hmm. yeah. I take in the input in the same way I take in any kind of a comment or I, uh, I allow people to see whatever I am, it is I'm doing and writing there. And I allow them to comment and criticize, and uh, and I'm also open to all kinds of suggestion. But I, uh, it has been misunderstood in the Neubauten side of it as well as here that there is some kind of collaboration. Gotcha. We didn't ask the uh, supporters to you know make suggestions on what we should play in Neubauten. 
Yeah. Uh, but uh, it is it is a crowdfunding. Yeah, I think for for Neugarten that is possible. I think for many bands uh, to to open up the the intimate inner circle of what you do in the recording studio and how you fight with each other and all that would probably not be a good idea, but for us it works. And I've, I've seen a lot of bands start to, to pick that up and um, sure. I, I would think well, it gives you a little more autonomy with what you're doing. They all, they all followed my button, yeah. Right. <laughs> so Continue at, uh, what's her name? What's uh, the Dresden Dolls? What's her name again? I uh, forgot her name right now. Yeah, well, there was a band called the Dresden Dolls. And the oh, Dresden now, Dolls, yeah. The singer now is famous, and she was one of the supporters of our first first uh, crowdfunding platform. And then she did the same thing herself after that, which mm -hmm. is fine. Everybody should copy that, sure. Yeah, the, uh, the residents have done it with a couple of their albums. And um... when is the first one that they did it? Um, it, it, I want to say it was like maybe five years ago. Yeah, well, see, we did the first one in 2002. 2002, yeah. So they're following your model. Yep. That's awesome. Well, Blixa, um, I, I said this would be 20 or 30 minutes. I've taken 45 of your minutes. That's still fine. I haven't got that much to do here in Portugal in the wonderful sunny old Gulf. And uh, <laughs> very good fish here. Nice. <laughs> well, at least you're in a good place. The weather's nice. So that's uh, yeah. that's a plus. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, See you another time.